Our scripture text today comes from the book of Genesis, a familiar book. And we're going to read from chapter 28 through to the beginning of chapter 29. Jacob left Beersheba, and he went toward Haran. And he came to a certain place, and he stayed there for the night, because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place. And then he dreamed that there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reaching all the way to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. And the land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. And your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring. And know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob woke from his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I didn't know it. And he was afraid, and he said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. And so Jacob rose early in the morning, and he took the stone that he had put under his head, and he set it up as a pillar and poured oil on the top of it, and he called that place Bethel. But the name of the city was Luz at the first. And then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone, which I have set up for a pillar, shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give you one-tenth. And then Jacob went on his journey and he came to the land of the people of the East. Well, some things I think are read better in the Bible than in real life. And this thought came to my mind a few months ago when the Israeli government released and announced plans to annex a substantial portion of the Jordan Valley, something you may have heard of, along with other parcels of Palestinian land, beginning this month in July. Eventually, it would leave the Palestinian people with only 15% of the land they originally possessed. And this peace plan that was proposed by the Trump administration has been widely condemned both inside and outside of Israel for obvious reasons. And even with the fragile power-sharing arrangement between Benjamin Netanyahu and Bernie Gantz, who are off and on as prime ministers, there is an agreement with a push to move forward. Netanyahu says yes, of course. Gantz says wait. And Israel's claim to this Palestinian territory, according to Netanyahu and his allies, is to hearken back to the geographical boundaries of the ancient Jewish kingdom of biblical times, which of course has been the long held objective of Israeli settlements since the 1970s. A belief that Palestine in its entirety is sacred land belonging exclusively to Israel by divine decree. And needless to say, not everyone agrees. Nevertheless, it does reflect a similar, a similar argument that I read years ago made by Jewish settlers as they were uh, settling in the region of Bethel, recorded in Bruce Feiler's 2001 best-selling book, Walking the Bible. Perhaps you've read it. And in Feiler's odyssey through the region, 20 years ago at this time, he came to this place, this ancient city of Bethel, and he offers this account. He says, 
We veered around Ramallah on an Israeli bypass road and rolled to the gate of Bethel, a modern Jewish settlement in the midst of Arab domain. And such communities are the tinderbox of Palestinian-Israeli relationship, an ever-shifting frontier of faith that triggers passions and hatreds that could only be aroused by the potent braiding of faith, family, and text. And the entire place was swathed in barbed wire. It was a voluntary ghetto, a Wild West outpost of choice, not force. And so we drove up the hill and decided to stop by the director's office, which was in a Quonset hut. And we stepped into his office, which was lined with maps and blueprints, and he had this grimace for a face and a scar across his cheek. And I asked him why he was here. We are here because of the five books, he said. We're living in Bethel on the road of the patriarchs, and this is our contract as he placed his hand right on the Bible, which sat prominently on his desk. And of all the places Abraham visited, why did he stop here, I asked. I cannot tell, he said. It's not a high place. It's difficult to defend. If there's a possibility to ask Abraham why, we, we will ask. And back in the waiting room, Avner remembered that he knew an American couple in town. The husband, a guide, was working, but his wife, Fern, invited us to stop by their home. And Filer learned that this family had initially moved from the U.S. to Jerusalem to an apartment in the old city. And after a year or so, their money ran out, and so they had to leave the city because of its high prices. And he goes on, he says, we, this is Fern speaking, we drew a circle with a half hour radius, she said, and started looking at communities. We knew it had to be religious. We wanted something established, enough to have teenagers. We wanted a place that was new enough to have young children, and we wanted diversity. And this place just fit the bill. There's one thing you didn't mention, Filer said. I know, she said. The Bible is not the reason we came to Bethel. But once we were here, once we were living here, every time Bethel was mentioned in the weekly Torah portion, only then did I feel a part of the community, part of the extended Jewish people. I remember the first time they read part where Abraham builds an altar in Bethel. And I thought, that's where I live. Tyler went on and said, do you feel living here has brought you closer to God? Yes, because I see purpose in our living here. If I didn't, it would be very hard. And I wonder how anyone who's Israeli and not religious can even stand it. If they don't have that connection to God with all the aggravation and hardship, why even stay here? So why do you stay here? I stay here because Jews belong in the land of Israel. God gave us this land, and it's not up to us to give it back. When we stood at Sinai as a Jewish people and said, we accept the Torah, we didn't just do it for that generation in the desert, we did it for all future generations. And then Fern and Philer went on to read portions of the Bible that referenced Bethel, including the story we just read, Jacob's dream. And then Fern took out photographs of people she once knew, one time residents of Bethel, but who had been gunned down on their way back home from a family gathering. And that doesn't want to make you want to stay less. It strengthens me. It makes me want to stay more. It strengthens my pride for this place. Not only was Abraham here and Jacob, but now I've been here and my children too. Not only did they make sacrifices, we made sacrifices too. And we did it for the same reason. We believe in God. Now, when I first read this account, like I said, years ago, I wasn't quite sure what to make of that last comment. The resolve and commitment certainly were impressive, but then barbed wire and gunfire and a life of constant enmity and stress, all for the sake of a belief in God. A belief in God. And I wondered, what is it that's being believed? 
What is it that's being believed? As I said, some things read better in the Bible than they do in real life. Now I realize that most Americans probably don't pay any attention, or at least much attention, or even care about the settlements along the West Bank, especially in these times where we're caught up in all the concerns about the coronavirus. And those that do either oppose them for the sake of justice and because of the Palestinian right to the land, or they support them because Israel's claim on the land appears both biblical and eternal. And as we know, typically it's liberal Christians that fall toward the former and conservative ones lean to the latter. And stories like the one I just read in, in Filer's book make settling in their homeland appear to be an act of honoring and protecting the Jewish people and the legacy and the faith, a fulfillment of prophecy and a satisfaction of God's will. And certainly we do call it the Holy Land and have. And biblically the stories are about it being the land of Israel. So if the biblical promises are meant to be timeless, why shouldn't Jews have eternal claim on the land? And it's a fair argument. But things are rarely so simple. They're rarely so simple. Frankly, the intent behind Zionism is not as straightforward and biblical as it would seem. There are vested interests for control over natural resources. There are strategic ones for military and security. There's economic ones related to tourism. And of course, there's the matter of ideology and race and, and history. In other words, there are never simple appeals to scripture, just because the Bible says it. And of course, Palestinian interests are, as well are very complicated. They're messy in their own right. However, over time, I have found religious justifications made by Jewish settlers in the West Bank unconvincing, given that most settle in these locations mainly because the land is cheap. Land that's confiscated from existing Palestinian communities, usually with the blessing of the Israeli government. And then angry complaints from Israelis about their suffering are only mirrored by those from Palestinians, of course, whose suffering tends to be, I would say, exponentially worse under Israeli occupation. And yes, mutual hardship exists, but suffering differs on the order of magnitude, on the or order of magnitude. For every Israeli who suffers and sacrifices 10 times as many Palestinians do. And we have to recognize that. The suffering may be the same, but the degree and the frequency of it is not. It is not. And of course, all of this is for land. Land presumably defined by a story, an ancient biblical claim on a hundred mile long stretch of mostly rocky, hilly terrain that has been coveted, that has been fought for and possessed by probably millions of people since the beginning of human civilization. In fact, fossil remains in the Jordan River Valley, they date back as far as 1.5 million years. Imagine that. So honestly, who gets to claim the land as their own? Who and in what generation has an eternal right to say, we alone can settle here? This is our land. Only our people are entitled to call this a homeland. Now certainly, as we heard, Jewish settlers argue the Torah claims it for them and the promises made to the patriarchs. And the biblical accounts are descriptive that Bethel, for instance, is a holy place, a place where Jacob met God, a sacred place where God named Jacob Israel. Wouldn't that be enough for Israel to possess the place where the father of the 12 tribes was so named? It's a critical moment of identity for Jacob and for people of Israel. And yet, is this the only story? The only story? More importantly, is it the only one that matters? Does it take precedence over all other histories? Is that a story above all other stories? You see, ultimately, 
Is the biblical story defined by the land or is the land defined by the story? Which came first? And does the sacred meaning of the story come from the possession of the land or is the sacred meaning derived from the telling of the story? You see, in the fog of history, it's hard to know. And the answers, if they were apparent at one time, may be even harder now to discern or affirm. Now, one thing is clear. Jacob's story here is scripture for Jews and Christians and Muslims alike. And because of that, one must be very careful about what one can claim as a word of God, particularly in relation to a possession of land, since depending on the perspective, that could be applicable to all. Could be applicable to all. But that said, it's also important to recognize that a story like this is not just a simple tale about an ancient patriarch, part of the biography, let's say, of a founding father, as we often take it to be. The, see, the tales of the patriarchs are narratives that really have no clear, definitive origin. Besides, they originate from an early time, if they do, it's only as oral tradition, and you know how that works. They've been told, they've been retold, they've been reimagined, they've been revised over time by later storytellers and events and perspectives and experiences. And since widespread literacy was a later development, especially from when this originated, by the time they were written down, even the most credible accounts would be viewed through the lens of Israel's history up to that time and the current interests of the generation that's composing them. It makes perfect sense. In other words, these stories were shaped over time to explain how Israel and Judah came to be, not what they were once like. Now, most readers of the Bible, and I don't mean to be too heavy about this, but most people who read the Bible are unaware that the ancient political division and rivalry between the sons of Solomon, Jeroboam and Rehoboam, shape many of the texts that we now inherit. And let me tell you a little bit about that. Jeroboam, the generation after Solomon, Jeroboam ruled the northern kingdom, Israel, and his brother ruled the southern one of Judah. And so you had the split between Israel and Judah. And according to 1 Kings 12, Jeroboam feared that his people would turn to Judah since all of their cultic obligations were fulfilled at the temple in Jerusalem. And so he established Bethel as a religious center for the northern kingdom of Israel. And you can see it in 1 Kings 12, in the vicinity of a Canaanite village called Luz. And so both the existence of Bethel and its significance developed under Jeroboam much, much later than the story of Jacob would suggest. So why then would Bethel be so prominent in the story about Jacob? Well, much like I said a couple of weeks ago, it's the winners who get to write history. The winners get to write history. And though Bethel was revered in the stories of the Northern Kingdom, it was reviled in many of the accounts of Southern Judah. And that held true for 200 years in this bitter rivalry until the Assyrians invaded the Northern Kingdom and eventually left that in ruins. And then a century later, Bethel was captured by King Josiah of Judah as he expanded his territory. And he redeemed, according to the text in 2 Kings 22 and 23, he redeemed Bethel by destroying the altars of Israel and then building his own, claiming the region in his effort to reunite the kingdoms and reestablish the Davidic monarchy. You see, Josiah not only destroyed any sign of the rival altar in Bethel. He also revised the stories of Israel to reflect his influence. And you see that particularly in 1 Kings 13. Josiah's religious reforms will show up in many of Jacob's stories to justify, to authorize, to reinforce the purpose behind his own reform campaign. And one example is where Josiah forbid uh, marriage with non-Israelites in order to keep the bloodline pure. 
Well, that's reflected in Jacob's refusal to marry the Canaanite women, hence the reason he married his cousins, Leah and Rachel. Another reform was the purge of foreign idols and art from Judah and Israel, which was illustrated in Jacob's similar purge of foreign gods before his later return to Bethel. That story is in Genesis 35. In other words, what we see, friends, is that the stories of Jacob, as we have them, reflect more of the character of Josiah's reign then they tell us anything about the history of Israel a thousand or more years prior to that. Now central, the reason I bring that up is because central to this is Jacob's claim that the land was given to him by God. So was that part of the original story, even though the name of Bethel was insignificant and Jacob didn't even remain there to settle until many years passed? Or was it in fact written into the storyline during Josiah's advance on Bethel, when such a story wouldn't have validated, would then have validated his own right to claim it. And since much of what we now have as biblical history was simply written down and edited during these years of Josiah's reign, it's only logical, friends, it's only logical to assume the stories of scripture directly reflect the character of those times. And so this claim on Bethel was Josiah's. It wasn't Jacob's. And it wasn't God's. And so as I see it, this makes any eternal claim on the land that we know as the Holy Land, any claim to be dubious at best. For as timeless as we presume these biblical stories to be, they are remarkably and profoundly time-bound. Time-bound. And of course, time and history, it changes everything. The world moves on. Other civilizations settle in the region. They possess the land for a time. They have their stories. They have their heroes. And so this makes eternal claims on land rather presumptuous, if not meaningless, especially in a region that has been possessed by millions over thousands of years. And despite biblical stories, Many of the claims of Zionism are not biblically justified. As a practical reality, Israel as a Jewish state really has no more right to claim the land of Palestine than anyone else. No one says can have an eternal claim on the land. So then, did I just ruin the Bible for everybody? Do we just dismiss these stories? as having no spiritual or religious value? Is there not a word from God that speaks to us out of this ancient story? If it's not about the Holy Land, what compels us then to hold on to this story as being sacred to Jews, Christians, and Muslims alike? That's a good question. It's a good question. For me, I think it's in the meaning of the name, Bethel, and the experience that transformed Jacob, even if the story itself is contrived. Because there's a message it tells. For one thing, Jacob really wasn't a paragon of virtue. He wasn't even a particularly religious person up to this point. But everything changed when he had a dream. This moment of extraordinary insight and clarity that utterly transformed his life. And the dream, as powerful and memorable as it was, where he felt he was at the gateway to to heaven, perhaps even a symbol of his own mortality, was enough to wake him up to a new awareness and consciousness of God. Enough to alter his worldview and even the way he would conduct himself and relate to others. And this dream became a transforming moment for Jacob, serving like a hinge even on his life that pointed him in a new direction uh, from the trajectory that had been taken. And because it was such a milestone for him, Jacob marked it as such, being the home, the place where God is, Bethel, the house of God. Not so much to be a mark on the land, but more as a mark upon his own life. And there's a difference. And it was the moment that changed him personally to where he became a blessing and not merely a manipulator of others, 
as we remember so well the stories of Jacob and Esau. Now, I don't know about you, but I find a great deal of meaning in that. Because I believe many people have similar moments of, of extraordinary insight that change them for the better. I see it all the time. And we, we can't mark them, these moments, in any other way than as a milestone on our journey through life. And if we are able to recall the place and the time when it occurred, we, we might just return to that place at some point to indulge ourselves in the sacred nature of that memory. But we can't claim the land. The story is only a memory. We can't recreate the moment itself that now lies in the past. The time and place that prompted the personal spiritual transformation themselves, all that has changed and moved on. In this story, Jacob could remember the experience, but he couldn't relive it any more than the Apostle Paul could return to the Damascus Road and, and re-experience his sudden conviction of purpose. You see what I'm saying, friends? We cannot claim the physical spaces and places that become sacred to us because what is uniquely meaningful is the story. The story, the experience, the memory of it, of what happened to us on a particular day and time when God gave us extraordinary grace and insight into life that forever changed us, that forever changed us. And that, I think, is what makes these stories and memories more sacred than places and time. History, whether collective or personal, it's made up of stories. We know that, of milestones that mark changes in our lives, that together shape who we have been and who we will come to be someday. And stories, not monuments, stories, are our truth, our way of conveying that which is meaningful and sacred to us. And we tell those stories to remind us and to guide us toward what we want to be. And it's been that way since the beginning of time, every culture. Now, Palestine is a storied land, a land of holy stories. Stories that have changed many people's lives. Three great religions find their stories there. And this is what makes it sacred. And that is the only eternal claim that can be made. And so I want you to think of this. When Israelis and Palestinians and the rest of the world realize that stories are more sacred than land. Then from one generation to another, for pilgrims and settlers, for inhabitants and immigrants, from timeless ancestors to future descendants, only then will there be room enough to righteously share that which is truly holy. Let's pray. Gracious God, we human beings are mortal, and so we find so much of meaning in life based on what we can touch and feel and own and possess. The material possessions or lands in many ways, we are territorial, just like the beasts of the earth. And yet to be like you in spirit, to be akin to you in who we are, we must realize that our spirit transcends all of this. And that we, like pilgrims, can travel from one place to another. We can have our meaningful, sacred moments. But that does not mean that we have a right to claim anything beyond the story. May this generation, particularly in Israel and in Palestine, may they be granted the wisdom to realize this. They may find ways to live together in peace, side by side, sharing stories, sharing lives, 
sharing hopes and even, yes, dreams. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.